my understanding and the work that I do, what distinguishes a sociological perspective from the other, uh, our sister social sciences, is that we're particularly interested in trying to understand um, the importance of social context in social life. Um, and so, um, but that's not a particularly narrow perspective or, or, or point of view because social context can range from the, the very big scale social context of the national state and how a national politics or national economy influences uh, life opportunities. So that's at the very big scale social context. And then you can drill down into the very close in and personal social context, peer group networks uh, for children in school, for example, would be a good example, instance of that. Or the family as a social context and the kinds of resources that it can command in helping its children get launched successfully. Um, and then the school is somewhere in the middle in terms of the social context of the school, and you can think about the resources it commands, its location, the enrollment mix, the demographics of the student body. Uh, there's the social context of the school can be very important to what children experience as they go through schools. So from my vantage point, uh, a, a, a laser-like interest in trying to understand where social context fits, fits into the broader picture of how societies work is really what sets sociologists apart from other disciplines like psychology or political science or economics. Well, a whole host of them. Um, so the one that I find most, most compelling and the one that I've devoted my research to uh, involves uh, the role of schools in society's system of social stratification. So I think the concept would be social stratification. And um, I could take a minute and just kind of elaborate upon that. Uh, the, uh, the word itself connotes, in a sense, what it's about, because strata implies layering. And the kind of stratification uh, that's of particular interest to sociologists is, uh, is the stratification of access to what are referred to as scarce and desired resources. Uh, so uh, these are the, the goodies that society can dispense. Uh, income, uh, education, uh, social power, the, the, uh, the ability to influence the behavior of others. Um, another scarce and desired resource might, be, might involve honorific distinctions like prestige and esteem, how people are looked up to or not looked up to, as the case may be. So these are kind of hierarchies of resources going from the very low end to the very high end. And, um, and much of the social dynamic revolves around gaining access to those resources. And so the system of stratification, in a sense, is the way society manages, not necessarily consciously, manages access to scarce and desired resources. And at the individual level, the issue is uh, where people are likely to wind up in those stratified hierarchies as a function of their life experiences, the characteristics of the family to which they were born, um, whether the school that they attend facilitates movement upward or downward in the stratification system. So for me, in terms of the, uh, an organizing theme for my, my own research and my career, uh, the, the concept of social stratification is a compelling one. Let me mention just two. Um, one has to do with the role of the educational institutions in the larger social frame in, in society. And the debate there is whether the expansion of schooling historically over time has been uh, the engine that's fueled economic development. So the way the modern society thrives is by educating more of its citizens so that they can be productive economically. And so the expansion of school enrollments on the one hand uh, yields a more highly educated population and that more highly educated population can go on and do wonderful things. Entrepreneurs, industrialists, um, uh, move the social order ahead. So. One side of that debate is, uh, is uh, of the, one line of re argument in that debate is is that uh, is that, soci that the expansion of schooling uh, leads to societal betterment and and uh, and a vibrant economy. Uh, the other side of that argument is that uh, expansion of schooling, the the emergence of a modern industrial society, really has precedent and it triggers the advancement the the expansion of schooling. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, which came first, which came after, chicken egg, that's the <laughs> issue. 
So the, uh, the, other, the other perspective on that is that uh, with the emergence of the modern econ economy, there, be, there then became a need for more highly skilled workers, and that encouraged uh, more folks, parents initially, to, to see to it that their children stayed in school longer so that they could be competitive and have opportunities in this new emergent economy. Um, so did the expansion of schooling come first and trigger the, uh, the emergence of the national economy, or did the industrial transformation of society from agrarian to industrial create a demand for more highly educated workers, and the education system responded? Um, so I think that, that's, that's one uh, area of contestation that's commanded a lot of attention in the, uh, in the literature uh, on the sociology of education. Uh, another one that's a little closer to my own agenda uh, asks about the uh, the role of the educational system in the stratification system, which is where I, I addressed in my your earlier question. Um, the issue there is, and again, there's another, there's an interesting duality: is uh, is education the springboard for uh, moving up in the social order, mm -hmm. springboard for opportunity? Um, in the modern era today, um, it's it's commonly said that if you want to get ahead in life, the way to do that is by staying in school, right? Uh, and, and nowadays, staying in school means uh, going to college, completing a college degree, and perhaps even continuing on to graduate school. And if, uh, if children from disadvantaged backgrounds are able to do that, then the, uh, they can be lifted up in term, on, the, on the strength of their good, strong educational performance and educational experience. They, they acquire the kinds of credentials that allow them to access good jobs at steady pay and good uh, promotion uh, opportunities. So that's one side of the issue. Uh, the schools function so as to provide for upper mobility of, of low income and disadvantaged children. The other side of the argument is that schools function more to preserve or maintain the social order, that is to perpetuate advantage and disadvantage across generations. The argument there being that the, kind of the children who are most successful in school and so reap the benefits in terms of later labor, labor market opportunities are children of families of privilege. So middle class parents, professional parents, uh, their children uh, come to school well prepared to do what's expected of them in school. They have the toolkit and the attitudes and habits of conduct that uh, school people expect of their students. And so um, they're more successful at school than children from a lower income family bracket. And uh, by virtue of being more successful at school, then later in life they reap the benefits. And so there is this tension or duality uh, that, that plays out in these discussions about which is the preponderant uh, role of schooling in the modern era, to provide for upward mobility and expand opportunity, or to perpetuate patterns of, of advantage and disadvantage across generations by virtue of which kinds of kids tend to be more successful at school. Mm -hmm. And that's a particularly interesting debate, uh, I guess, for me, because it's one that I've, <laughs> I've been drawn into for many years. Um, but what, beyond that, what makes it interesting to me is that it, we tend to think of it as an either-or argument. Schools do this or schools do that. But in point of fact, they do both simultaneously and without contradiction. You know, poor children who do well in school, and there are many of them, tend to realize the benefits of doing well in school. But the likelihood of you know, doing well in school falls to uh, children of more privileged family background. And so you have these two dynamics playing out in the educational system in parallel, concurrently. And, um, and that makes it a more challenging kind of debate. Which of them wins out? You know, which is the predominant tendency? It's not this or that. It tend, it's more a mix of the two. And um, many, many uh, person years of research have been invested in trying to sort that out. So there are debates galore in sociology of education. Uh, uh, I think as a, um, as a discipline, uh, sociologists are constitutionally disposed to argue. <laughs> and, uh, and, and sometimes those arguments are, are productive ones because they engage issues that are important to our understanding how the world works. Well, um, there's no single kind of dominant uh, approach to researching issues of this sort in sociology. Uh, the, 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 the tools that we bring to bear in, in, in addressing our questions span a wide spectrum. At the, and I guess you can, it's easy, you can see the, uh, 
the boundaries of it most clearly, what the extremes, uh, the, there are some sociologists work using st quantitative statistical techniques that uh, are very refined analytic methods. Uh, I tend, my research tends to be of that nature. It's, I don't know, sure, I'm not sure it's that refined, but uh, I, I do quantitative analysis of survey data uh, to try to understand uh, the kinds of issues that move me. Uh, so you might have a survey, uh, a national survey of 20,000 students attending more than 1,000 schools uh, and you ask questions of them about their educational goals. Uh, if you have access to school records, you can find out information about how well they've performed in school, their achievement test scores, the courses they've taken. Uh, uh, if, if the project is particularly ambitious, you can also talk to their parents and you can talk to their teachers. and. Uh, if with, with, with deep resources, you can do this over time, track the same children over time. And uh, by compiling a database of that sort, you can then step back and ask questions about ex the experiences young people have had at school and, and how those have uh, potentially had an influence on their later life well-being. So quantitative statistical analysis of survey data or archival data like census data, that's, um, that's one kind of mode of analysis that's very, uh, has considerable currency. At the other extreme are uh, qualitative studies of educational experience. So these are researchers that will go into a school or a handful of schools. You can't do 20,000 students in 1,000 schools if you're going to do first-hand systematic observations. Uh, so this, this is a more kind of an attempt, these methods try to uh, attempt a more uh, in-depth and nuanced <clears throat> understanding of what children experience in their home life or in schools. Uh, by focusing in on a manageable number of schools and a manageable number of families and then observing them intensively over time and uh, from that base of information then trying to, uh, to pose questions and make sense out of the observations. So you have uh, qualitative observational studies in schools, in schools and families. Uh, you have statistical analysis of data, survey data or, or archival data of various sorts using very refined statistical methods. And in between, you have the meeting ground of the two, which is becoming increasingly popular and I actually think is the wave of the future. Um, uh, mixed methods or multi-methods uh, studies which combine quantitative analysis and quantitative. And when done well, you get the best of both. Quantitative anal analysis allows you to sketch the big picture but necessarily in a somewhat superficial way because you don't have depth of understanding of the individual experience. You have what people tell you when you check off a box in a questionnaire. Uh, the qualitative component can drill in in a, very, uh, in, in a very detailed and intensive way to try to kind of fill out the kind of skeleton with some flesh and blood, real people in the real context of your life experience. And by marrying those two predi uh, those two research traditions, uh, when it's done well and it's not easy to do it well, um, you potentially can ha have a much better rounded out picture of, uh, of the experience of young people in school or their family life. Oh, lots of them. <laughs> so, um, so there are boundaries to what we as uh, sociologists uh, in, in the discipline of sociology can contribute. Um, and outside those boundaries are lots of things that are critically important to making schools work well. You know, so we don't develop curricula. You know, we don't do that. That's, uh, leave that to the educators and the people who understand in a deeper way how children learn and the content of what should be learned that's important. Um, we don't, as sociologists, develop principles of pedagogy. You know, um, uh, offering, you know, how should teachers teach? That's somebody else's agenda. Um, so there are lots of things that are, that are really kind of central to the workings of schools that aren't really central to our discipline and the kinds of questions that we uh, compose. Uh, there also are practical limits to what a sociological approach can illuminate in terms of uh, the research methods we can command. Uh, so, for example, uh, it's very challenging to do true, true experimental research on questions of social context. So, if I want to understand um, how important it is for a child to go to a school with a, with a, socioeconomic, with a healthy socioeconomic mix 
as opposed to a school that um, enrolls disproportionate, almost altogether low-income, poverty-level children. If I want to understand that, the the way to get the most compelling and definitive evidence would be to randomly assign kids. <laughs> you go to this school, you go to this school. I wave, a, with a, I wave a wand and I say, you, or pick names out of it. I say, you go to this school, you go to that school, and uh, then we'll wait a few years and we'll see what happens. So you, you, you assign children to go to one, schools of one type or another. And the random assignment, if you do it well, should make the kids essentially interchangeable in all the things that are important to doing well in school. And then later on you can look and see how they're performing and if, if one, one child, one group of children is performing noticeably better than the other, uh, you have reason to think that it's the school context that makes a difference because the kids themselves are, are alike. Well, we can't randomly assign kids to different school contexts. We can't randomly decide which child should repeat a grade and which child should move ahead to see the consequences of grade retention. Um, so our, our, our toolkit is restricted in that sense. And so questions that in some abstract sense we could in better inform aren't available to us because we can't do the research that way. Um, so there are areas of educational practice that really sociologists don't get involved in, and then there are uh, limits of the method, limitations to the methodologies that you, we use, and so some questions that we might like to be able to pose we can't do with the authority that we, we would like to. Um, so we, don't, we can't do it all. But the, the sociological agenda when it comes to helping understand how schools work, nevertheless, uh, gets into some, you know, any number of really critically important issues. Well, there are boundaries, but I think they're increasingly permeable. And, um, and sociologists, perhaps more than other disciplines, have been, we've been very good at borrowing from other disciplines. Uh, so um, we look around not necessarily systematically, but we, you know, we look for good tools that can help us kind of advance the agenda of our research and then try to adapt them to our particular uh, research questions and topics. And so I don't think that there is a distinctive sociological method. Uh, I think what more sets us apart are the kinds of questions to which those methods are, are, are put to use. And so, um, yeah, so some sociological research comes out um, looking very much like the kind of work an economist might do, but not from the perspective of an economist, not from not using the theoretical ideas and kind of conceptual framing that an economist would, but, you, but posing sociological questions using those methods. And like, like, likewise, the cultural um, anthropologist might do on-site intensive observation, uh, and, and in that sense, look. You know, the methodology might be very much like a sociological approach to studying the issues, but again, the issues themselves would distinguish the disciplines. Glad to. Uh, that's the granddaddy of all <laughs> empirical sociology in the sociology of education. Uh, in fact, the Coleman Report, there's a, there's a very strong Hopkins tie to the Coleman Report. Um, James S. Coleman, uh, uh, at the time of his, uh, before his passing, was undoubtedly the most eminent sociologist of education in the country and perhaps in the world. Uh, as a young scholar, he started his career at the University of Chicago and in 1959 was recruited to come to Hopkins to create a new academic department for Hopkins. Uh, originally it was called the Department of Social Relations, uh, but over time it re evolved into a more traditional Department of Sociology. Uh, when, while Coleman was at Hopkins, he was invited by the uh, Commissioner of Education, the National Commissioner of Education, uh, to conduct a research study. Uh, the study was mandated by Congress in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was at the time, and I think may still be today, the only congressionally mandated social science uh, research study. Uh, and, and, and it was the most ambitious one ever conducted. Uh, the tie-in with, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was that Congress wanted to understand conditions of equality of edu educational opportunity in the public school system throughout the United States. And uh, Congress then charged the Department of Education to conduct a research that would inform that. And the Commissioner of Education turned to Jim Coleman to put together a research team 
uh, to design what that study would be. The congressional mandate was not very specific as to what kind of project. Uh, so the Coleman and his colleagues were charged with designing the, the research project, implementing it, and then um, posing questions of the data that they gathered to help inform uh, our understanding of the conditions of the modern educational system back in the 60s. And uh, what Coleman and colleagues decided they, to do was, um, because it had to speak to conditions of education throughout the country, of necessity it would require something of a broad brush approach. And they decided to use the tools of, of, uh, of survey research and the newly developing uh, ability to pose questions of large volumes of data that uh, computerized data analysis allowed. This was all emergent. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't as though you had the power of the modern laptop right sitting on your desk where you could analyze you know, reams of data. Uh, so this was a path-breaking and innovative project in many respects, and very ambitious in scope. It, uh, it sampled schools uh, throughout the country and uh, administered questionnaires to children in those schools. Um, almost a half million children in total, and uh, sampled from all grade levels, first grade through high school, uh, and uh, asked questions about the, uh, with a particular interest in, in uh, minority youngsters and the, their experience of schooling and how that compared with the experience of non-minorities or, or white youngsters uh, in various parts of the country, uh, but also low-income children compared to children who were from better off families. And, uh, and so uh, the final report was submitted to Congress in 1966, and it was called the Equality of Educational Opportunity Report. In shorthand, it's referred to as the Coleman Report, since he was the lead. Um, and it offered up a number of really uh, unanticipated results. Uh, keep in mind that the tie-in the tie with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so we were just developing our commitment to uh, remediating historic wrongs. And the sense of the day was that uh, providing disadvantaged minority children a high quality of education would help lift them up out of poverty and, and put them on a path to a better, better life. The expectation was that this research would establish that the schools that were available to disadvantaged minority children were woefully inferior to those available to whites living in the same region. And um, it turned out that wasn't the case. Uh, the differences were not dramatic, and they tend to revolve more, differences in school quality and school resources were not dramatic, and they tended to revolve more around uh, place of residence and region of the country than around race ethnicity. So schools throughout the South uh, lag behind those in other regions of the country, uh, but that was true for the schools that African American children attended as well as the schools that white children attended. Um, uh, rural schools and schools in high poverty urban areas uh, uh, fell short in terms of quality standards to schools in the emergent suburban ring. Um, but again, it was more a matter of location and, and, and race. And so um, that, was, that was one uh, very surprising and in practical political terms disappointing conclusion of the Coleman uh, report because it was expected that this analysis would provide um, the scientific rationale for investing more, much more heavily in school improvement for disadvantaged minority children. Uh, another uh, big conclusion from this effort, and it's one that's had a lasting impact, as has the resource con uh, conclusion for that matter, is the, uh, to try to, to parse out the relative importance of family uh, circumstances and resources for children's academic performance against the school's uh, resources for ac children's academic performance. And by academic performance, the focus was on standardized achievement scores. So we're talking about you know, the real kind of nuts and bolts of what counts for doing well in school in some sense. <clears throat> and to the extent that the Coleman Report was able to do that parsing convincingly, it concluded that family makes the difference much more so than school resources makes the difference. So in, in some highly simplified uh, sense, it would be you know, is it more important to be born to a family of comfortable means as opposed to a family of uh, lacking in resources, on the one hand, versus attending the school that's well-resourced versus a school that's lacking in resources? And the Coleman Report's conclusions tilted he heavily on the family side. Okay? Family first. and uh, Family is the first educator, and the family environment is, is critically important to children's academic development and, and later life well-being. So this... Uh, adjudicating this question, is it family or is it school that's, uh, that really makes the difference? 
The report tended to come down on the side of family. But it also interrogated the characteristics of schools that did seem to matter. And, um, and it looked at things like the, uh, including the socioeconomic and racial makeup of the school, you know, if it's a low-income school or a high-income school in terms of the enrollments, if uh, the racial ethnic composition, uh, predominantly African-American enrollment versus a white enrollment. Uh, it looked at uh, intangible school resources, the, um, the number of books in the school library, uh, the number of science labs it had, uh, how old the school building was, things of that sort that most, most, of, intu of, most of us intuitively would think of, is important to the quality of the school. Also looked at the, some of the characteristics of the curriculum offerings and looked at, uh, at some of the uh, teacher's experience, uh, qualifications, the certification and, ex and experience of teachers. So it's teachers, curriculum, school resources, and the student mix. Those were the big f four areas of consideration. And what the report concluded was that the student mix tended to trump the, other, the others. Uh, and in particular, uh, what stood out in their analysis was the socioeconomic mix of the students in attendance, not the racial composition of the school, um, but the breakdown in terms of parents' educational levels. You know, it was important to go to a school where most of the parents were college educated. As a, when, what difference does that make compared to going to a school where the parents, most of the parents say did not finish high school? Um, higher income enrollment versus lower income enrollment. And, uh, and so one of the things the report uh, provided was a, um, a, a, a help, help sustain the rationale for moving forward an agenda of school desegregation, again, Civil Rights Act of 1964. If the, if the mix of students enrolled is one of the more, most important qualities of a school, then uh, it particularly, becomes particularly important to provide disadvantaged minority ch children and, and children of low-income families the opportunity to, to attend schools with a healthy socioeconomic mix because that will help them uh, do better in school. Mm -hmm. and, and so there are a whole host of issues that were um, embedded in this Coleman report. Um, some of them uh, uh, were quite, some of the conclusions were quite satisfying with respect to the kind of politics of the day. Uh, some of them were quite disappointing, but wherever they fell on that spectrum, no one would deny that the Coleman report was um, was amazingly powerful as a as a document. And it did help, I think. Uh, that's a public policy tie-in. But in terms of its role in in the social sciences, I think it helped encourage folks to think that to believe that the tools of social science could be deployed usefully in a way that would help inform these big questions of public policy. And, um, and so in that sense, it really was the, um, the launching pad of, the, um, of a whole research agenda that's, uh, that continues today mm -hmm. to, to, tr to, try to, to try to use the tools of not just sociology, but the other social sciences also to help understand questions of education policy and practice and make schools better for kids. That's the, that's the goal. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's really an interesting question. It's, what, the, the 1966, how many years are we talking? It's, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the Coleman Report, and you still see it referenced uh, in the literature, uh, reverentially, if you will. It's, it, it, people still reach back to that original effort and, uh, and treat it as gospel. Um, and that's entirely understandable because it was such a high-profile effort in its day and so ambitious. But in point of fact, uh, you know, time goes on and, and a lot has been invested in, in researching mm -hmm. these similar kinds of questions with superior tools. You know, we're no longer at the era, in the era when computers were just becoming available for, for use in this kind of research. And, uh, and our, our uh, uh, toolkit for interrogating uh, large data sets has become vastly improved. And so these kinds of questions today can be uh, addressed with uh, with, with a, stronger, uh, a stronger methodological approach than was possible in the day. Uh, the Coleman Report used what was state of the arts, but the state of arts has, has moved on. And so I would say that some of the conclusions in broad stroke terms have held up well, but others not so well. Um, the importance of family over school as a launching pad uh, for what comes next, I think has is, is been uh, sustained 
time and again in, in a large volume of research uh, conducted from various vantage points using various methodologies, not just survey analysis. So family versus schools, that's held up. I think uh, the best evidence today uh, suggests that the, the social composition of the student body is even more important uh, than the Coleman report led us to believe. Uh, and the dimension that stands out as being particularly important involves the socioeconomic mix of the student body as opposed to the racial makeup of the student body. Uh, and I do think also that as we've drilled deeper into the issues, uh, studies since have identified uh, various uh, aspects or uh, features of school resources that really do uh, make, a, make a large difference in, in children's lives. The, the report was not very um, it not, was not very thoroughgoing in its, in its, in its efforts to, to tease out particular resources. It didn't, it didn't have the same quality of data that we can get today. And, I, and so I don't think those, re, those conclusions have held up particularly well. Um, so it's evolving. I mean, it still is. 50 years later, we're still, we're still learning more about these kinds of issues. But that's, this may sound trite, but that's the way good science gets done. You know, somebody has to get there first. And, uh, and pose the question and uh, provide us with a starter set of conclusions. And then if, uh, if the topics are compelling and, uh, and it attracts the interests of others, what we'll do is kind of look at the foundational work and say, aha, that's interesting, but how can we do it better? And then we try to do it better. Okay. And there's, you know, there's no end to that. You know, you're always trying to do it better because you never get it exactly right. And, um, and there's no shame in that. There's no shame in having an ambitious report that put forward some conclusions 50 years before, 50 years earlier, and then coming to some agreement, uh, those of us who work in this area, that, well, maybe it didn't get it quite right. Well, that's fine. There's no, uh, that's fine so long as the original conclusions weren't destructive in any sense. <laughs> you know, it would be a shame if they informed bad public policy, and then later on we discovered that it was mistaken. Uh, but in terms of the science of it, that's exactly as it should be. Well, I can't think of any of, on that, that, of that scope, you know, a half million students throughout the country and so forth. Um, but there have been any number of other studies that have exercised uh, a powerful influence in our thinking about schools and our understanding of how schools work. Um, the, if you, you know, it'd be interesting to have a discussion around the table you know, about which, which ones, you know, what do you, which ones come to mind when you pose that question. Uh, a couple that come to mind for me might not be on other people's lists, but, uh, but uh, they're all mine. So Robert Dreben uh, wrote a little volume uh, years ago. I think, I think it was, uh, publication date was in the 70s, I think. Uh, and it was entitled on, on What is Learned in School? And this was not a, this was a think piece. I mean, kind of, kind of a conceptual account, kind of thinking about how schools function in the modern era and what they contribute to society. It wasn't an empirical exercise at all, but very thought-provoking. You know, the obvious thing when you ask, like, it, it's a question, right? The book title is a question. It was, well, the obvious answer is, well, we learn school stuff. You know, we learn math. <laughs> we learn reading skills. And when you get farther along, you learn chemistry, biology, physics, and all that good stuff. So the, there's the academic content of what is learned in school. And everybody recognizes that. But Dreben's analysis pointed out kind of a deeper contribution to what is learned in schools. And what he, what he concluded is school, much like Durkheim, is the place where you learn to be a modern person. And by that, he meant... Uh, Sometimes this is referred to as the hidden agenda of the schools because it's not, it's not overt in the curriculum. You don't take a course on becoming a modern person. Uh, but in point of fact, the way schooling can, is structured and conducts itself encourages a modern way of thinking about yourself and where you fit into the social order. So, Dirk, I keep saying I've got Dirk on my mind. So, uh, Dreben um, developed a typology of what he called norms. And he said, these norms are important to modernity, and the school is where young people inculcate them or acquire them. It's called the process of socialization. How to learn, it's where you learn the culture and values of your society. And so, for example, 
one norm for Dreamin was an achievement orientation. And people are valued because of how, how well they perform important tasks. And it's back to, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, if you, uh, you can come from a family of multimillionaires, but if you flunk your math test, you haven't achieved at the level expected. On the other hand, you can come from extreme poverty, and if you ace your math test, you're doing quite well. So it's, it's an achievement orientation that is embedded in the way schools work uh, that then prepares young people for what's going, to, what's going to be expected of them when they move on into the world of work. You've got to perform. And it's how well you do that counts, not who you are. Uh, another of Dreben's norms is the norm of uh, universality. Everybody gets treated alike. You know, we can't show favoritism. Uh, it's inappropriate. If you, if you said that that's the way things worked back at the turn of the 20th century, people look at you like you're crazy because who you are is really what counted. Right? Um, but in schools, we, we treat everybody alike. Uh, because, again, it's performance within the school system that's what's important, not you, what you bring into it in terms of your life outside. And so we move away from tradition as the governing principle for what ought to be. We move away from the arbitrary uh, use of authority as the way things are or ought to be to a set of standards, a set of values and expectations that Durbin, Durbin said, uh, told us were particularly appropriate to the modern social order. So this is how we learn to be modern people, and it happens substantially in schools. And I think that's profoundly important. Yeah. <laughs>